When studying the history of Soviet mountaineering and of its tragedies, one cannot fail to mention the Chivurai Pass incident. With its ample number of conspiracy theories and rumors of confidential documents that were either lost or destroyed, this story can rival that of the Dyatlov Pass incident. Today, I'll dive into what really happened in the Chivurai Pass in 1973. On the 25th of January 1973, 10 students from the Russian city of Kuybyshev, modern-day Samara, set out on a hike through the Kola Peninsula, a place that attracted mountaineers, adventurers, and explorers from across the whole Soviet Union. Today, many tourists are still drawn to the unique natural beauty of the peninsula. Meanwhile, let me tell you about the people who joined that ill-fated hike. Mikhail Kuznetsov was the head of the group. He had studied at the Kubashev Aerospace Institute, but dropped out after his second year and joined the army. Afterwards, he got a job at the military department of the Kubashev Civil Engineering Institute, while at the same time studying for a law degree. An experienced traveler and hiking club member, this was his fourth visit to the peninsula. He had already gone on two hikes through the Hibini Mountains, and the Lavazara Massif. Valentin Zimlanin was the second leader of the team. A graduate of the Kubashev Aerospace Institute and member of the local hiking club, he had also previously traveled to the Kola Peninsula and taken challenging trekking routes. Ilya Altshuler was also a graduate of the Kubashev Aerospace Institute. He was a member of the local student construction brigade, a hiker, and cameraman, as well as a talented singer who took part in a singer-songwriter festivals. Lydia Martina had graduated from the Kuybyshev Polytechnic Institute and worked at the Akron factory that, among other things, produced radio equipment for the military. Her job would later become the source of rumors surrounding the group's demise. Could she have known too much? The rest of the team consisted of first-year students of the Kubashev Aerospace Institute, the 17-year-old Sergei Gusev, Yuri Krivov, Artem Likant, Anatoly Paragov, and the 18-year-old Alexander Novoselov and Yuri Ushkov. They had all gone to school together, where they joined the local hiking club and, starting in the sixth grade, went on hikes. However, the planned trek through the mountains on the Kola Peninsula, which was given a difficulty rating of 2, was their first serious expedition. Only Ilya and Lydia had previously gone on routes of that level. This leads to disagreements in discussions about the teammates' training level. Some say that the climbers were amateurs who knew little about the route and had overestimated their abilities. Others insist that they were well-trained physically and had studied the route thoroughly, and that their only disadvantage was equipment, which at the time wasn't easy to procure. Some things you had to make yourself, like for instance gaiters, and it was commonplace to borrow mittens and other warm clothes from acquaintances. What we do know for sure, however, is that before going on a difficult track, the group had to do a trial hike. Local journalist Shabalina recounted, Back in Kubashev, the group had qualified for the upcoming hike with the Sports Tourism Commission. Its members didn't doubt that the team had prepared well. However, Anatoly Perigov's cousin, Viktor Varashilov, was convinced that there was in fact no trial hike. Here's what he told about the so-called hiker report books. It was often the case that successful hikes would be marked at the nearest post office. Anyone could come in and say, I'm a hiker, I completed a route, please give me a mark. It was Victor who had attempted to get to the bottom of the tragic incident and had organized a hike along the same route. Uncannily, just a day before the hike was supposed to start, his car burned down, killing him. The official investigation ruled out a premeditated act, but that seems hard to believe. However, that may be the route that the group chose was the following. 
From Olenia Station, they took a bus to the settlement of Revda and skied from there along the Chivruai River through the Lavazaro Tundra. They planned to reach the endpoint of their route, the town of Kurovsk, on January 31st. What makes the Lavazaro Tundra special is that it's located in a mountainous area. The heights there do not exceed 4,000 feet, which seems like nothing compared to record-breaking peaks. But even at such altitudes, the area's unique climate can lead to the development of mountain sickness. The place is surrounded by sheer cliffs, battered by strong winds. The humidity here lies at 90%, while winter temperatures can drop down to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Even 15 degrees Fahrenheit will require serious clothing, usually reserved for much lower temperatures. High humidity and sharp winds change one's perception, a usually fairly mild 15 degrees feel like minus 25 degrees. It was into these challenging conditions, which worsened even further in January and February, that the team set out. The trek was supposed to last less than a week, but both the route and the weather were far from simple. The student group arrived at the starting point of their route on the 24th of January, having taken the train from Moscow to Olenya station, and the bus from there to Revda. The entrance to the mountain pass lies less than 2 miles away from the bus stop, not counting an altitude change of 1100 feet. On the first day, the 25th of January, the group had gone through the pass and made camp for the night in the valley of Elmer Yak River, on the edge of the forest. The 26th of January was frosty. The group crossed Seda Zero Lake and went upstream the Chevruai River, passed by Verhnia Lake and made a rest stop in the forest to have lunch. It happened to be the birthday of one of the hikers. As it grew dusky, instead of spending the night in their tents, the team pressed on into the valley of the Kitkuai River. No notes explaining the reasoning behind this decision were found in their diaries. There was no point in hurrying. The hike had only started. There was plenty of food and they were to reach the pass the next day. They ascended the plateau via the northern route. The wind was fierce, but it blew them in the back. Villagers from Ilma and Pancha reported wind speeds of over 110 miles per hour, writes Peter Lukoyanov. It is indeed odd that they decided against making camp for the night and instead took the northern route to the plateau. Meanwhile, the weather started getting worse. A blizzard hit, the snow cutting the hikers' cheeks and gusts of wind sweeping them off their feet. They managed to make a stop at a bluff over the Kitkuai River. By the end of the day, the weather worsened even more. The temperature dropped below minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit. The atmospheric pressure also fell rapidly, and a hurricane hit the area with winds reaching speeds over 110 miles per hour. Tamara Muravyova, a friend of the students, recalls, It was during those days that the locals were warned of an approaching Arctic front. People were even forced to stay inside the local concert hall after a performance to wait out the storm. But when Misha Kuznetsov's group set out on their route, there hadn't yet been any worrying weather data. So they took off in the direction of the Chivroi Pass, as was planned. It isn't easy to survive in such conditions without cover and warm clothing. The next day, another group hiking along the same route, students at the Moscow Aviation Institute, led by Viktor Samadelov, reached the same plateau that Kuznetsov's group had been on recently. A gruesome view awaited them. Under the icy wind, slightly covered with snow, lay motionless five young men. It was Mikhail Kuznetsov, Yuri Krivov, Anatoly Pyrogov, Sergei Gusev, and Yuri Ushkov. It wasn't clear where the rest were. The inadvertent witnesses photographed their green findings, took with them the documents of the group leader Kuznetsov and hurried into Kirovsk, where they reported the incident. 
The weather, however, made it impossible to launch a search operation right away. Only on the 2nd of February did a MI4 helicopter finally bring a rescue group and a detector from the prosecutor's office into the area. They were accompanied by Vladimir Borzinkov, head of the rescue service at the Moscow Aviation Institute's hiking club. He had known several of the victims. The helicopter couldn't land on the spot of the tragedy due to bad weather, so they arrived in Puncha village, which became the headquarters of the Chivrai operation. On the 6th of February, the search group found the bodies of Kuznetsov, Krivov, Pirogov, Gusev, and Ushkov. Kuznetsov was still clutching the edge of the tent that covered the others. In late February, Zimlanin and Lekant were found about two miles away from the main encampment. This suggested that they might have tried to reach Umbazero Lake in an attempt to find an exit from the plateau, but had no strength left to return. Even further off lay the bodies of Martina and Novoselov. They were only found in March. There was still warm clothing left in their backpacks. They hid behind the rocks and were completely covered with snow. When the helicopter was taken off, the downwash blew off some of the snow, and we saw an arm, recounted Borzenkov, while Lukyanov wrote. Novoselov put all of his warm clothes on his companion and remained clad only in a plaid shirt. Ilya Altshuler was found last, on June the 1st, once the snow had melted. He was dressed warmly, but had no mittens on. Apparently he was trying to return to the others, but didn't make it. This is evidenced by the position of his body. He was on his stomach facing the pass, as if he were climbing towards where the tent was, explains Borzenkov. Given how strong the blizzard was, his friends probably couldn't see him. By the time they had gone past him, he was most likely already dead. Most probably, it became impossible to make camp and set up tents after the weather worsened sharply, a common occurrence in those parts. The team likely split up, five people went out to gather information or seek help while the rest tried to hide from the storm under a tarp. Tragically, all of them froze to death. The search party included soldiers from the Kundalaksha division who combed through the area with a mine detector. There were rumors that the search was conducted in secret, but Borzenkov dismisses them as hearsay. Yes, the military was involved. Our search for the bodies was accompanied by two soldiers who rotated every 10 days. At some point, they brought in a police officer with a shepherd dog, but it soon injured its paws on the sharp stones and was sent back on the first helicopter with the dog handler. The military helicopter's main job was to bring supplies to the search group. Occasionally, we would ask it to make a circle to inspect the area from above, so there was no secrecy. What do we know about the bodies? When the students were found, their skin was a dark brown color. Several of them, according to some witnesses, were missing their eyeballs. During Sergei Gusev's autopsy, examiners found symptoms of hypoxia. January the 27th was put down as the official date of death. The time of death, around 1 a.m., was ascertained by checking at what time his watch had stopped. Zimlanin and Lekant likely survived for longer, till 5 a.m. Altschuler died at 4.33 a.m. There is nothing mystical about watches stopping at the time of death. Their mechanisms simply froze once the bodies became cold enough. Alternatively, the time could be calculated based on when their watches were last wound up. So, what really happened with the group from Kubushev? As always, there is an official version and several unofficial ones. The first version states that the students died after becoming trapped in weather conditions that were unendurable for humans. Indeed, in those parts, a strong wind and heavy snowfall can begin unexpectedly, lowering the visibility to practically zero, while high humidity aggravates the frost. 
In such conditions, hypothermia often becomes the cause of death for whole groups of mountaineers and hikers. However, though this version sounds convincing, there are some who don't believe it. Official versions are seldom believed, especially by the victim's relatives. Some of them say they weren't given any information about the group's death. For instance, we knew that my cousin had a camera with him, but we didn't get it or any film back, though some other personal belongings were returned. It also seemed odd that several lads in Kuybyshev were given closed casket funerals, recounted Varshilov, Anatoly Purigov's cousin. Varshilov also had concerns about the team's equipment. According to him, it was suitable for spending the night in the forest, but not on open ground. Recently, this case was discussed on a popular Russian talk show, and one of the guests suggested that the camera might have gotten lost in the archives, whereas the closed casket funerals had to do with the damage that the bodies received while being out in the open, similar to what happened in the Kruovina group incident. Some people don't trust the official version because, like with the death of Evgeny Abalakov, the criminal case files disappeared, either lost or classified as confidential and later disposed of once the safekeeping period expired. One way or the other, the archives of the Murmansk region prosecutor's office hold no documents related to the case, and we don't even know if the prosecutor who dealt with the case is still alive. He was 47 years old at the time of the incident. Journalists had also sent requests to the prosecutor's office in Samara, with no luck. There are, however, those who do believe the official version. Amateur investigator Valentin Dikturov adds the following details to the story. The Lavazara Massif consists of fairly high mountains that form a cirque, a rather long and high cliff wall surrounding a valley. These cirques look like a huge snail. The students who hid in the tent died at the following coordinates. This place is located on the slope of a mountain peak, surrounded with lakes on both sides. There is also a small lake on the summit itself. Both sides are connected through a white gorge, which at this location is divided in two by a large rock, making rarefied air accumulate and squeeze out the oxygen. Then the hurricane hit, bringing with it wet and icy winds. When the two airstreams collided, it was like an explosion. The blast squeezed people's eyeballs from their sockets and tore their eardrums. Deafened and blinded, they writhed under the blows of the hurricane. Those hikers who weren't killed by the blast sustained injuries and had no chance of surviving in those temperatures. According to Dekterov, the group was hit by a snowstorm, and the tarp couldn't shield the five teammates on the plateau from the piercing wind and snow. Two people tried hiding behind a rock. Three others were even less lucky. They descended into the valley, but without their skis, which was a mistake. Dekterov also asserts that the temperature dropped lower than the official data suggests, down to minus 49 or minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Meteorological tables show rather different figures, however, and Dekterov's theory isn't supported by any evidence. Those who have studied the incident have created a whole list of fatal mistakes made by the group. They went into the mountain pass at night. They took the northern route, which was longer, and complicated the descent amidst the darkness and snowstorm. They split up. The group leaders were unprepared to deal with extreme situations and had included a level 3 passage into a level 2 route, which you are not supposed to do. Furthermore, the group was initially supposed to be bigger, but four experienced hikers ended up not going, and no one reported that fact to the commission that had previously greenlighted the hike. It is also worth noting that the dramatic events on the Kola Peninsula are rarely discussed. It became yet another tragedy overshadowed by the Dyatlov Pass incident. The only news article about the group's death came out in 1973 in the Tourist magazine. It mentioned the fact that the hiking authorities in Kuybyshev 
and the Murmansk region were reprimanded, but said nothing about the students, their route, and how they died. Not even photographs of the team members had been published. The KGB had forbidden the publication of any details for the duration of the criminal investigation. Back in the 70s, information about such incidents, which could alarm the citizens, was suppressed. Newspapers didn't write about them, they didn't get reported over the radio. I think that's the reason, and not that the group may have died under mysterious circumstances, says Tabriz Sharafiev, a meteorologist who had worked on polar stations for many years and participated in preparations for the launch of research rockets from Kapustin Yar Air Base. Rocket launches are part of yet another version of the group's death. According to it, a sounding rocket that was supposed to track and deflect hurricanes drifted off course, frightening the students. Panic ensued, the hikers started making chaotic decisions, which resulted in the differing locations of the bodies. Other variations of this theory involve poisonous or radioactive probes, rockets or experimental weapons that, despite the strong wind, could have sprayed a deadly substance over the pass. There is another theory that can be considered separately or as one of several reasons for the group's death. It has a mystical and scientific version. The first one has to do with the mythology of the Kola Peninsula, in which the area around Seda Zero Lake has a bad reputation. In the Sami language, Seid means sacred. On the lake's bank, perched on a pedestal of smaller rocks, stands a sacred stone. It served, and maybe still does, as an object of worship for the Sami and neighboring peoples. If we look further, we'll find that in Scandinavian mythology, Seder is a type of shaman-like magic. The Chivruai Pass is all but cursed, even its name is eerie. Chiv means evil spirit. Eif means to drown or to be buried in sand. So it's like you'll either literally get buried under the snow or metaphorically have dust thrown in your eyes and become confused. This theory states that supernatural forces drove the hikers to madness that fateful night, for they have intruded upon sacred land at a time holy to the ancients, during the change from winter to spring. The scientific version also suggests that the hikers went mad, but explains it not with evil spirits, but with a condition known as arctic hysteria. It involves high levels of anxiety, cramps, and even hallucinations, and only happens within the arctic circle, usually during long polar nights. Some start laughing hysterically, some become depressed, some completely lose their minds. Some witnesses recounted that several of the hikers were undressed. Perhaps this was a case of paradoxical undressing, which can occur in the late stages of lethal hypothermia and is also a sign of mental malfunction. Of course, there are also far-fetched versions that seem pretty preposterous, that the group encountered a yeti or was attacked by aliens. There is, however, another, less outlandish theory. Valery Diomin, who spent many years exploring the Kola Peninsula, thinks the students may have fallen victim to a magnetic anomaly. Some simply get a headache, some faint, others hear voices and singing. This is because this area has what's called geopathic stress zones. If you look at a tectonic map, you'll see a radon emitting faults in the Earth's crust around Seda Zero. These change the intensity, structure, and interconnectivity of the geophysical fields, primarily magnetic and gravitational, which explains fluctuations in human weight. Geopathic stress zones were also discussed as a possible reason for the Korovna group incident in Hamar Daban. How many such anomalies are there in Russia and around the world? I personally have been to Kola Peninsula myself this spring. I've traveled to the Hibini Mountains, which are located to the west of the Lavazero Massif. Though I wasn't camping or hiking there, I went there for alpine skiing. I experienced the unpredictable weather to the fullest. While we were at the top of the mountain, the snowfall was so heavy 
that we couldn't see beyond the tips of our skis. The wind was merciless, and even though the temperatures were in the 30s at that time, the wind made it feel much colder. Ten minutes later, while descending, we noticed that the wind suddenly stopped completely, and now a dense fog lay around us. My instructor and I and the rest of the team felt dizzy, sick, and even a bit scared, because you just don't feel the movement of the air even when skiing down the slope. In the next 10 minutes, the weather changed again. The sky cleared, the sun was shining, and the mountains seemed peaceful. But we knew it could change any minute. So yes, this is a truly unique place. I can't even imagine what's the weather like here in the winter. An obelisk now stands at the location of the hiker's death. Carved out on its commemorative plaque are the names of the victims and the date of death the 28th of January. This date differs from the one in the autopsy documents because the exact date was never pinpointed. All of them, except for Sergei Gusev, were buried at the Rubezhna Cemetery in Samara. I don't know if it's worth comparing this story to the Dyatlov Pass incident or other similar cases. What matters is that lives were lost. Ten young people, full of energy and hope, whose journey to one of the world's most beautiful places went horribly wrong. Which version of events do you think is most likely? Subscribe and share this video with your friends if you found today's story interesting.